thank you, Ariel, for that introduction. And thank you all um, to the MENA program and Danny and Rebecca and everybody else for inviting me to speak here today. Um, so Hamid was my advisor and dissertation chair. And I came to Northwestern and indeed re returned to the US from my home in Delhi to study specifically with him. It's the only PhD program that I applied to. Um, in my many hours working as his research assistant, um, converting his vast library of videotapes into DVDs, our conversations often centered on shared experiences of moving between our native and adopted homelands, of longing and belonging. For this reason, I always loved the prefaces and introductions of his books. Learning about his life was essential to understanding the work. In light of this, I want to discuss how Hamid's research and methodologies help us make sense of a century of transnational and diasporic um, film production between India and Iran, our two homelands. I draw on his theories of national cinemas, social history, and media work to offer some thoughts on this itinerant film history. So in 2017, the Iranian filmmaker Majid Majidi released his first Indian film, Beyond the Clouds. Majidi is a prominent director of art films, including Children of Heaven from 1997. This earlier acclaimed film was part of Iran's post-revolutionary cinematic wave of realist and humanist films about children. Children of Heaven concerns impoverished residents of Tehran, namely a young sister and brother, whose touching relationship sustains them through hardship. Beyond the Clouds is a broad reimagining of the story, focusing on young adults and set entirely in Mumbai, featuring Indian actors and shot in Hindi. Majidi made use of India's more liberal film production policies, though they're not that liberal, to construct a tale about illicit activities such as drug dealing and forced sex work, advancing beyond Children of Heaven's tamer tale of lost shoes. Majidi's 2017 film was highly anticipated in India, where Iranian art house films are deeply respected. On his promotional tour, Majidi spoke at length as to why he chose India for his first foreign set film, pointing to shared culture and heritage between the two nations. While it was Majidi's first time working abroad, Beyond the Clouds marked his second collaboration with famed Indian composer A.R. Rahman, who had previously scored Majidi's controversial epic depicting the life of the prophet, entitled Muhammad, Messenger of God, from 2015. In the same year as Majidi's Hindi cinema debut, the diasporic Indian filmmaker Anup Singh made the films The Song of Scorpions, another international but Hindi language production filmed and set in India. Singh chose the expatriate Iranian actor Golshifte Farhani to lead the film. The folkloric melodrama filmed in the Rajasthani desert has resonances with the popular film traditions of both India and Iran. Though Singh said his story was motivated by the specific social context of violence towards women in contemporary India. Neither Beyond the Clouds nor The Song of Scorpions were equal co-productions between India and Iran. Rather, they instantiate a contemporary global art film economy which sources funding from a combination of public grants and private producers and brings in talent from a variety of national backgrounds. However, for both these films, the casts, locations, and formal modes situate them in a lineage of what I'll call Indo-Iranian filmmaking. The films also mark a revival of interest in Indo-Iranian cinematic uh, exchange that had its previous high watermark in the early 1970s, when film Farsi still flourished in Iran. Subha Osham, known in Persian as Homoye Sadat, from 1973 was a co-production shot simultaneously in Hindi and Persian and featured a mixed cast that included some of the most prominent stars of each national cinema. India's Wahid Rahman, alongside the Iranian Muhammad Ali Fardin and Indian Sanjeev Kumar, and the two men played brothers in the film. However, despite an Indian director and composer duo, this film too emerged in a national context, taking place entirely in Tehran and focusing largely on Iranian characters. Rahman played a troubled dancer, drawing on the tavaif trope of the courtly female entertainer that again was common in both countries' mainstream cinemas at the time and in their longer literary and cultural history. Interestingly, Rahman appears in The Song of Scorpions too, 
as Golshifte Farhani's mother. And while this subject is beyond the scope of the paper, um, Kumar, Rehman, and Farhani's casting also speaks to the relevance of racial passing between Iranians and North Indians for these transnational visual cultures. Both Beyond the Clouds and The Song of Scorpions, released in India and at international festivals, to mixed reviews and an unsatisfactory unsat box office showing. Several critics registered tonal imbalances, especially in The Song of Scorpions, that they argued derived from the incompatible styles of a non-resident Indian director, a Parisian Iranian actress, an Italian editor, and so on. In other words, they asked, why did these international productions strive to be so national? Both were set in India, featuring Indian characters and adhered to common melodramatic themes of Hindi cinema, anchored by characteristic mu musical sequences. However, in their tightrope act between representing and bolstering national identity on the one hand, while speaking to Indian, Iranian, and other Southwest Asian audiences more broadly, they are aligned with this long tradition of cinematic exchange between India and Iran. So today I consider this history through the lens of Hamid's theories of national cinemas and media work. And as others have discussed today, media work refers to the combined operations of signifying institutions, as Hamid puts it, or media's unconscious impact in relation to the functions of hegemonic institutions and industries. I propose that contemporary Indo-Iranian film and media production functions as a component of a new, maybe alternate or counter media work. And I'll return to this idea in more detail at the end of the talk. Um, I should also mention that this has not previously been my area of research, so I was interested in just presenting these as some exploratory thoughts um, on what I see as a contemporary resurgence of a very long regional culture. Um, however, uh, as I'll also touch on further, it relates to my research in the sort of decolonial modern histories of Southwest Asia, um, which demonstrates continuities and regional relationships beyond colonialism and Western political and cultural influence. And Hamid always encouraged me to dig into the subject of Indo-Iranian cinematic history, given his own fascination with transnational and diasporic film production, but also from his longstanding view that scholarship is enriched by drawing on one's own personal past as a basis from which to explore broader social histories. And indeed, what first motivated me to work on this topic as a diasporic Indian subject myself was the wish to make sense of my own spectatorial identification with Iranian cinema. So in Hamid's Social History of Iranian Cinema, Volume 1, The Artisanal Era, he traces Indo-Iranian film production back to the 1920s when the first Persian language talkie was produced in Bombay. Um, and Maziar touched on this as well, but I'll just briefly recap some of it. So this film, Doktori Lor, or The Lore Girl, was directed by the Iranian emigre Abdul Hossein Sepanta, working with Parsi film producer Ardashir Irani. And Parsis are an Indian religious community descended from Iranian immigrants. So as many have noted today, Hamid's comprehensive and authoritative history of Iranian cinema establishes the national cinema's roots as transnational and diasporic. His research on early Iranian cinema demonstrates the role not only of Bombay-based Iranians and Parsis, but of Armenian Iranians, Qajar court photographers abroad, Western missionaries, and many others in the formation of an Iranian national cinema. While he recognizes the centrality of national identity for Iranian modernity and therefore Iranian cinema, he's consistently problematized the lens of national cinema in relation to Iranian film and media. In A Social History, he writes that scholars and readers should be sensitive to the, quote, heterogeneity and constructedness of the two concepts of Iranian nation and Iranian national cinema, end quote. Hamid also notes that just as the spatial understanding of Iranian cinema and nations unfixed, so is its temporal context. And as such, Iranian and other modernities should be also understood as, quote, asynchronous, asymmetrical, and partial, end quote. And my co-panelists, esteemed co-panelists, have also demonstrated this through their studies on Iranian cinema in relationship to cosmopolitanism and nationalism and modernity. This pioneering research has also facilitated other scholars such as Samita Sunya, 
Claire Cooley, Bedram Bartovi, and others to take up the question of Indo-Iranian co-productions and more broadly, cinematic linkages between South Asia and the Middle East. The co-productions are largely popular films that capitalize on regional star power and more recently on auteurist cachet, but also engage cinematic and cultural idioms that to this day resonate in both national contexts. For this reason, um, I think about these cinemas as afterlives, echoes, or threads of the Persian, Persianate, which I'll talk about more in a minute. My own book project thus far has looked at the comparable, if not directly interlinked, trajectories of state-sponsored documentary production in India and Iran. In particular, I argue that experimental and avant-garde tendencies in Indian and Iranian state-sponsored film are products of post-colonial and modernist nation-building ideologies. While this work focuses on modern nationhood and nationalism, I look past colonial and east-west entanglements to think about how the south-south transnationalism and development ideologies impacted cultural production and post-colonial national identity. Um, so taking these together with instances of the films that I'm going to talk about, um, this lineage of film history initiated by the Lore Girl, um, it provides us with an opening to think about an alternate or adjacent history of trade, mobility, migration, and circulation. The Persianate, and I know many people here know what that is, but I'll just define it, um, refers to the geographical and imagined sphere consisting of regions that shared literary, ethical, or aesthetic sensibilities, which derives from their governmental, educational, and literary use of Persian. Several scholars here have far more expertise on the subject than I do. Um, however, this concept provides a genealogy for Indo-Iranian cinema, separate from contemporary borders and national cinema frameworks, and it also intervenes against histories that argue that colonialism disrupted the Persian its sphere. As the historian Manakia writes, quote, it is assumed that colonial rule changed the fate of South Asia into something distinct from places like Iran. But if we look past the state and consider continuing trade networks and the social links accompanied by these, uh, that accompany these transactions, we see that the circulation of people, texts, and ideas between the two lands continued, end quote. While Kia argues that this extends into the early 20th century, it's clear that vestiges remain through the medium of cinema, not just in literary and theatrical work. For example, beyond co-productions, romantic epics such as that of Leila Majnu or Shirin Farhad, also known as Shirin Kosro, have been the repeated subjects of films in both countries. Indeed, the most recent Indian film adaptation of the Shirin Farhad story which originate, uh, originates in the Persian epic, the Shah Nome, was remade as a contemporary comedy entitled Shirin Farad Kito Nikhil Pari as recently as 2012. Did I have a slide of this? Yes. Um, one essential link between Persianate cultures and cinema is in their influence on the constitution of modernity in both India and Iran. The emergence of cosmopolitan cultures included the increasing mobility of Indians, Iranians, and other Asians in Europe, South Asia, and the Middle East, and the expansion of modes of communication, particularly in the 19th century. Kia writes that the two societies had a shared heritage and ideas of moral refinement, among other things, adding that in the late colonial period in India, quote, older Persian and ethical norms could still function as a common lexicon. These con continuities and the social and political ties that they enabled demand a reconsideration of Indian and Iranian modernity as interrelated, end quote. Thus, I extend the idea of the cinematic Persianate further to argue that these extensive trans-regional relations did have relevance not only for the constitution of modernity, um, but for the formation of modern nation states. And indeed, in the decolonizing era, after India's independence from British rule and Iran's governance, first by a powerful constitutional monarchy and now the theocratic Islamic Republic, the two nations have actively sought to foster a political and economic relationship with each other. However, cinematic exchange has lar largely been characterized by representations of or references to pre-modern Persianate history, such as Leila Majnu, etc or else only privilege one of the two modern nation states in narrative, language, and location. There is one exception to this in the recent co-production, Salam Mumbai, from 2016. 
Set in the present day, the story focuses on a romance between two medical students, an Indian woman and an Iranian man. These characters are play played by Dia Mirza and Mohammad Reza Gozar, both well-known stars in their respective, country respective countries. Indeed, the Indian press referred to Gozar as the Indian SRK or Shah Rukh Khan, referencing India's megastar actor. Salam Mumbai was directed by Iranian filmmaker Korban Mohammadpur, filmed in Tehran and Mumbai, mostly in India, though, um, and features Persian, Hindi, and English dialogues, as well as Hindustani music. Salam Mumbai gestures continuities and shared heritage between the two countries in its story. For example, the romantic leads bond over their love of Hafez. It also constructs its plot around less publicized but contemporary forms of exchange, such as the presence of Iranian students in India for higher education. As such, the film strives to be transnational in its production, narrative, and cinematic codes, such as musical sequences. Interestingly, much of the dialogue between the two leads is in English. Neither learned the other's language for the role, but nor was the film dubbed. Salam Mumbai released in theaters in Iran before going to India and other international markets. It was extremely popular in Iran. As was widely reported, it set an opening weekend box office record, surpassing Asghar Fahadi's The Salesman. Notably, it was also the only one of the set of three films to have a general release in Iran, having conformed to some local film production edicts, such as no physical contact between male and female actors and no dances. Nafisi's film history research and methodology provides an avenue to understand these texts together. First, his notion, notion of formations of national cinema, which include intersecting socio-political, industrial, cultural, ideological, spectatorial, textual, and authorial formations. Are you sure you covered all the formations? Um, in their fluidity, these intervene against the category of national cinema, while simultaneously making its construction legible. This provides an exciting framework to think about Indo-Iranian cinema in relationship to the imagined community of the Persianate. It incorporates the socio-political context of trade and exchange relations, spectatorial formations, and cultural traditions and references, such as sensuous iterations of Mughal entertainment. Some of this material has been theorized as Islamic um, cinemas, and scholars have made more extensive arguments about the relationship of Persian at customs to popular Indian and Iranian film forms, building on Hamid's work. However, I'd like to use another of his theories as well, media work, to contend that not only pre-modern cultural histories, but 20th and 21st century political and economic relations have encouraged Indo-Iranian cinematic exchange. This theory of media work, um, as I mentioned, I think of as maybe an alternate or counter-media counter work, argues for the role of ongoing South-South relations in shaping consciousness and public opinion in relationship to film production and spectatorship. Um, Salam Mumbai, Beyond the Clouds, and The Song of Scorpions each came out between 2016 and 2017 on the heels of a historic Indo-Iranian trade agreement in which India committed $500 million to help construct the Chavahar port, facilitating trade of oil, tea, rice, um, mutual aid, things like that, between the two countries and their neighbors, such as Afghanistan. In 2016, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi made a state visit to Iran to sign the deal, the first Indian leader to do so since the 1980s. The Shabahar port is Iran's first and only deepwater oceanic port located on the Gulf of Iran. The port project was initiated in the early 1970s by Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, then Shah of Iran, who mobilized several large-scale development projects during his reign. However, his plans were curtailed first by the Arab oil embargo in 1973, and then his own removal from leadership during the Iranian revolution. However, the Islamic Republic maintained interest in building the port, as did India, despite its strong diplomatic ties with both Israel and the United States. Indeed, Modi, who's known for his facilitation of Islamophobic violence and Hindu nationalism, pushed the project forward after inaction from previous Indian leaders. For India, the Shobohar port presented an opportunity to create a South and West Asian power bloc that conveniently circumvents Pakistan and helps advance its interests against China. 
Iran, crushed under the weight of Western sanctions, similarly perceives Chabahar port as a route for new economic and political solidarity based on diplomatic ties that, despite intervening political crises, have not been severed. Modern political relations between the two countries have often been framed in terms of that historical Persianate relationship by leaders such as Nehru and the Shah and many after. As Hamid writes, contemporary media work is, quote, motivated by the libidinal, political, public diplomacy, and commercial economies of collectivities such as nations, end quote. And this film and media production that strives to sustain and reconfigure the relationship between these two nation states should be considered not only an afterlife of longer cultural histories, but can also be read as a media work that speaks to the recentering and uh, or component of a media work that speaks to the recentering and reorganization of political and economic power along ancient roots. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'm grateful to Hamid to you know opening up all these diverse questions for everyone. Um, yeah, these are just sort of some new thoughts that I was interested to share, you know, based very deeply in his work, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak about it here. Thank you, thank you, Hamid.